Natasha and Ed Tatton, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thanks, Howie. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us, Howie. A pleasure. I just uh, finished perusing your fantastic book uh, called Bread Without the A. That's it. Was, yeah. I was explaining to my daughter who I was interviewing, I said, and she wasn't entirely paying attention. And I said, um, the book's called Bread, B-R-E-D. And she thought I had like spelled out B-R-E-A-D, like she was an idiot. So I had to explain that it, the, the, the E is missing. Why, why is it called Bread, B-R-E-D? It just came around like I started making bread for the community. Um, and it, everyone was just saying, Ed's bread, Ed's bread. And it was kind of, oh. we wanted then when we got to the point of opening a, a bakery, um, it just seemed a bit sort of cheapening the brand to call it Ed's bread. Um, even though our Instagram is Ed's bread and our website is Ed's bread, the, the bakery is called just, just bread, just kept it simple. Mm -hmm. I make bread. Uh -huh. Um, so it's kind of got my name in it and it's what we, what we make. So it's bread spelt like Ed. <laughs> Got it, got it. I was wondering if there was some sort of mysterious... Uh, well, no, there's a lot more you, know. you could read into it, like uh, the fact that it's a sourdough bakery, so we do breed a culture, so it's mm. bread. It's not, oh. you know, yeasted in that way, so you could read that into it. Also, in some European languages, the word bread is, it looks more like B-R-O-D, like brod, um, mm. and you would find that in maybe some of the more Scandinavian countries. And so it kind of looks a little bit more like that, which is interesting because we make some more Scandinavian style breads like rye bread as well at the bakery. So there's a whole lot of things you could read into it, but really it just came down to Ed didn't want to call the bakery um, Ed's bread because there are some cheesy businesses out there like, I don't know, I'm just creating names, but Luigi's Pizza or something like that. Mm -hmm. It can sound a little like cheap. And I think Ed was nervous about that. So we, instead of having it as Ed's bread, we just spelt bread like Ed. So we just made it a portmanteau, just combined the two words instead. Mm. And it's quite catchy. Very good. Just like, I'm at bread, the bread book. Um, yeah, it just made sense for the cookbook as well. That's what we've, that's our brand identity. That's how people know us. That's what a lot of the book is made out up of. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the, the cookbook is, is called Bread, but then it kind of has that subtitle, um, sort of plant-based baking. So we're a 100% vegan bakery. So um, there's a lot of cakes and cookies and other things in there as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. And this way, if you want to change your name, you're not, uh, you know, you're not wed wedded to a brand. You have, you have freedom. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Mm. So I guess my, my first question was just re reading about, you know, your, your journeys and your bio and, uh, sp you know, specifically, Ed, your story of, you know, working at all these, you know, Michelin starred restaurants and working with these master bakers and for, for you know, for decades of experience making bread. Yeah. W what what is the sort of thing that you learned from that that you can't learn from a cookbook or a YouTube video like, you know, what's... Yeah, I mean, I... What, I, what loved, rises there? Yeah, I love uh, cooking and spending time in the kitchen with my mum a lot more than my siblings when I, when I was, like, five, six years old. So I always had, like, a connection with food, like being around it, and knew I wanted to be a chef. Um, so I actually got my first job in a kitchen when I was 13 years old. Um, mm. And I think straight away, what, what I would summarise is basically work ethic, I think, youngsters it's really important to get into the workforce as soon as possible even if it's a field you don't know you know you're not going to be in forever i think it just shows it, it teaches you work ethic um and sort of working as part of a team and working hard and all those sorts of things and for myself i knew i wanted to be in kitchens that made everything from scratch you know fine dining culture really intrigued me um, and it's, it's kind of a bit like the army. Some people relate it to that, you know, it's very strict. It's like, this is the way we do it. This is the way that you, you know, properly chop up an onion or something like that. And I just fell in love with it and I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Um, so I've been in kitchens for 25 years, but I didn't formally train as a, as a baker per se. We made bread and, and, you know, I've worked on pastry sections, but a lot of my 
baking skills have been self-taught. Um, so I had the background in kitchens and working as a chef, the culinary background, and then a lot of it, was, especially with the sourdough, was, was self-taught or um, working with other chefs, owners that wanted to have sourdough on their, on their menus. Mm. It's funny you mentioned work ethic because in reading the book, you know, the first section, like, you know, 30 or 40 pages about how to make this one sourdough starter. And and you basically like, you know what, just keep making it. You're going to get it wrong at times. Just just keep experimenting. And I kind of listened to the reading the book with like my my trainer's voice in my head. Like, yeah. like, like there is a work ethic that you you want to impart in the book, like do this a lot of times, fail, learn, practice, which is very different from like, you know, I go on YouTube, I want to find a recipe. I just, I want it to work. I don't want to totally. work for it, but, but there's uh, you can't get it necessarily get it right the first time. Uh -huh. No. And I feel like the, the problem with sometimes is people jump around, it doesn't work. They go to another recipe. So mm. for us, it's kind of, you know, work on that country sourdough, simple, simple sourdough, you know, some whole grain in there, and, and you'll see, you'll achieve more because you'll notice those little adjustments that you make, water temperature, oven temperature, and you'll, and you'll get a really nice loaf that you'll be able to enjoy. And then you can sort of move on and start incorporating seeds and fruits and nuts and things. Mm, gotcha. And Natasha, what about you? What's, what's been your journey to, to this point? Well, I mean, I grew up as a vegetarian, self proclaimed vegetarian um, and I started also working in kitchens quite young but more as a part-time job to supplement my income. My first job in a kitchen I was 17 and I worked in a private hospital as a ward waitress which was very interesting. Um, lots of interest. What's that? So in a private hospital like it's almost like a hotel so it's like very nice and they have very nice food like three course dinners and things like that so it's for wealthy people there was a lot of like plastic surgery and then there were also lots of older people but we had like celebrities coming in the hospital and my job was to go around uh, in the evening and see if anyone wanted a night drink and also serve them dinner and collect the dishes and that kind of thing and I did have some interest I met some celebrities and I I did once find somebody that died, which was quite freaky when you're 17. But I had that job working at, in a kitchen. So I had a little understanding of hospitality and um, good service and, you know, hygiene and those kind of foundational kind of skills. Um, but then I went on to become uh, an English teacher. I love language. I love linguistics. Um, I like working with people. So I had a career for 15 years as an English language teacher. But... I still worked in hospitality um, here and there to, again, supplement my income. So I did catering gigs. Um, I was a waitress in, at the time, the UK's best vegetarian restaurant in 2008. I worked there for two years. Um, I, I did lots of different things, eventually moving to Canada with Ed 10 years ago. I became the first cook at the kids' ski school. I would cook um, for 800 kids and ski instructors, which was wild. Um, but I just wanted a change at that point from my career as a teacher because some um, industry changes had left my position kind of null and void. And I got quite burnt out because I put a lot of energy into my role as an academic course coordinator, making agreements mm -hmm. with the universities, going to conferences, networking, marketing the school I was working for, uh, learning more about the business side of the operations and then my job out of my control due to external factors kind of was null and void and there was nowhere to go and I felt really kind of let down and disappointed. So I'd said to my boss, I just want to go to Canada. I want to snowboard for six months. I just want to push a button on a lift and not use my brain at all. And she looked at me like I was crazy and um, she didn't get it. But, you know, for her, it was uh, her job was different to mine, managing the school. My role had kind of been taken away from me. So I felt very kind of uh, exhausted with that industry at that point. Came to Whistler, uh, worked at the ski school. And then while I was working there, I started to learn more about plant-based cuisine, um, as in veganism, 
And eventually after that, in the summertime, we worked on organic farms, vegetable farms, Ed and I, we went around. That's where the sourdough culture was born. We would do maybe five hours work on a farm for bed and board. And then we would have the rest of the day to ourselves. So Ed started making sourdough and we would go to all our farm placements with a little a little trolley, a little cart with all these flowers and scales and nuts and seeds. And uh, we would turn up at the farm and say, where are we staying? And they'd say, that's your trailer over there. We'd say, okay, does it have a fridge in it? And they, what, why? Oh, well, we've got a sourdough starter with us. And they, they thought we were so crazy, these British people turning up with a sourdough starter <laughs> to come yeah. work. It's, al- it's almost like having a toddler, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. But it was lovely, wasn't it? Because Ed would make the bread and um, give it to the farmers. And uh, actually, uh, one of the farmers used to make sourdough at a farmer's market, and it reignited her passion for that. So she got into making sourdough again, which was awesome. Mm. We came back to Whistler. By this point, I was going fully vegan. I was working as a raw vegan chef in a sort of juice bar, making salads and wraps and raw desserts and things like that. And there was no going back for me after that because then all these documentaries came out and I was like, yeah, there's no other way, you know, I'm vegan through and through now. Um, And Ed, I don't want any uh, non-vegan products in the house. I don't want any meat, any dairy, eggs, etc. and he was working. So you, you were the you were the first one to do that. So Ed, Ed followed. Oh, yeah. And I wasn't. As, he had to do it. I just said I don't want to live in yeah. a house that has that in it because this is my home. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> he sort of said he had to do it. Kind of, yeah, exactly. Like we we always <laughs> take a heavy, like mostly vegetarian diet anyway. So it wasn't like uh-huh. it wasn't like we were consuming a lot of animal products anyway. Um, so it wasn't. You know, and there'd been discussions before, so it wasn't that sudden. It wasn't like a quick overnight mm-hmm. thing. But um, mm-hmm. I was open to it, to be honest. I knew, like, I have cardiovascular issues in the past, and I have a stent um, in my aorta, which basically is like a little spring, helps sort of blood flow and everything like that. So for me, I was like, this is only going to be a good thing. You know, it starts quite selfish for me. I, I would call myself an environmentalist then, but didn't fully understand it, you know, did recycling and, you know, tried to Mm -hmm. do my part. But for me, I was like, okay, I'll cut out dairy and I'll occasionally, you know, meet if we go to a fancy restaurant or something that's a special occasion. And then quickly, like Natasha said, the more you know, the more information you find out. I was like, well, actually, if I call myself an environmentalist and an animal lover, you know, what's, what's more ethical and environmental than not consuming any animal products? Um, So, that was a big sort of, it started as a health sort of um, gateway. And then very quickly, the more that I learned, I was like, actually, this seems like a, a good decision to make. Um, mm-hmm. And I would never go back now. It's quite interesting. Some some vegans sort of do it for a few years and then, you know, go back. For me, it's, it really is a lifestyle choice. And I couldn't imagine, you know, eating mm-hmm. animal products again. And therefore, mm-hmm. once we opened the bakery, mm-hmm. you know, it was a natural, natural thing that that would be. 100% plant-based yeah. as well. So when you when you decided that, you know, I understand you're like maybe 90, 95% of the way there and ethically it's totally a fit, but you're still trained mm-hmm. as a professional chef. Like, totally. was there some was there some mourning about, you know, MOU or any about what you're giving up just in terms of identity? Because like my understanding of like what fancy chefs, Michelin chefs do is like they do yeah. magic with meat and butter I'm- and... Cream. Yeah, it was it was hard because actually I was still working as a at a farm to table restaurant as a sous chef for about a year, um, being vegan before we opened the bakery. Um, I was very lucky. My my head chef at the time, the one of the owners, was very compassionate and very uh, understanding in my decision to do that. Um, he was quite. You, so you took. You told them, like, you could have kept it quiet, right? Totally, absolutely. I said, look, you know, wherever possible, I'd rather, you know, not do the butchery and and not cook. So I was generally worked on the line anyway. Oh, sorry, on the sort of plating the food. Um, Mm -hmm. So I would do that. I would take care of the bread program, the sourdough. Um, I would make sort of staff food. So as much as possible, I wasn't trying to get involved with 
with that sort of prep. You know, I'd prep a lot of the vegetable garnishes, purees, you know, things like that. Um, got he heavily into sprouting, like making the, making the sourdough. So for that year, um, and because I'd done it so long, a lot of the time you can cook and and just get someone else to taste it. Can you just double check this, that it tastes good, mm -hmm. so I wouldn't have to consume it myself? But I did feel a bit of a fraud. You know, I wasn't really living my true identity. But at the same point in Whistler, we don't have any vegan restaurants. There was a couple of juice bars, but not anything that was going to pay me, you know, what I needed to pay my bills and open the bakery. So it was part of the journey. Um, I pushed vegan dishes on the menu, probably about at that time. I would say at least 40% of the menu was vegan within sort of, garnishes that went with you know a beef uh, dish mm -hmm. you know all of the veg on that was vegan so if anyone came in we were able to make them a nice tasting menu that was fully vegan um i think there was an influential moment though ed when you went to la to do some work in bakeries and you mm -hmm. went to matthew kenny's restaurant plant food and wine yeah and this was the first fine dining experience you'd had that was vegan I and did, you came did, back, I, yeah, you came back and you were like, wow, like, I can't believe what they're doing with vegetables. You know, it's, um, mm. you know, it's one thing to make a vegan chili but at home, but then to go to a fine dining restaurant and see another level of vegan food, like what can actually be achieved. And I think you found that as a chef really exciting. You were, cause you'd like, you knew all about the meat, you knew all about the fish and in my opinion, it's so easy to make something seem gourmet by putting words on the menu like foie gras and waggy waggy beef. And, uh, you know, it just sounds gourmet <laughs> just because you've used an animal. But actually, like, <laughs> where's the where's the skill, like, in the chef? You know, it's force-fed duck. It's like, that's not actually that gourmet, is it, really? Like, force-feeding an animal? Like, when you could do something so much more creative with vegetables and not hurt any creature um yeah so. and i mean we've seen that as well you know 11 madison park in new york going fully plant-based you know so i think in the fine dining world it is changing not really quick enough but there are mm -hmm. leaders in the industry that are making that more ethical choice mm -hmm. yeah and and you guys are sort of you know one of the vanguards of the movement you know there's the people doing the health the people doing the ethics people doing environmental stuff but you're the one saying taste this yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, if it tastes good then who cares if it's vegan or not like to a non-vegan person you know they're sort of like mm -hmm. yeah I'll go and, uh, most of our customers aren't vegan at the bakery but you know they enjoy mm -hmm. the product they like the service um they like supporting you know a family-run local business so so why not you know and it's vegan well that's even better we just need so, these options available to people and then they will be able to choose them. They don't, people don't need to make that moral decision for themselves. And I think mm -hmm. it's really difficult to expect everyone to get it and put their hand up and go, I'm a crazy vegan now because <laughs> everyone's, it's, it's things like heritage and social status and culture and religion and politics. There's so, there's so, food is such a loaded issue for people. But you can cut through all of that when you eat something delicious you just want to eat it again so we just need to have good vegan food out there and one of my gripes is that a lot of the vegan food that you can find in restaurants and shops and places it's either made by a vegan that doesn't know what they're doing but they're really passionate about veganism so they want to make vegan food but they don't understand about cooking techniques and um, textures and that kind of flavor combinations so they don't make it very well or it's made by people that aren't vegan but feel that they need to cash in on veganism to be accessible so they're not losing any customers but they don't really make it with passion and they might undercook the vegetables or make it really bland because they think well it's vegan so people are used to eating crap food if they're vegan so they'll just be so grateful for a vegan option they won't they won't complain which is quite honestly true you know we don't like to <laughs> complain about our vegan food because we want to encourage people to keep making it um so i feel like there's a lot of bad vegan food out there um and it's up to us to show people it doesn't have to be that way you know that there is a better mm. way <laughs> 
Yeah. Remind me if you come visit in Spain to take you out to dinner because <laughs> the way you described it sounds like my cooking. <laughs> yeah. I was like, this this is not going on Instagram. <laughs> no, and not every dinner we make at home is beautiful. Like I have an Instapot. I'm a very busy business owner. I don't always have time to make a gourmet meal for myself. I'll just you know, throw some veggies and stock in the Instapot and we'll have some sourdough yeah. soup for dinner. Like, we're not yeah. gourmet people. Yeah. No, right. mine is just bad. Mine is just poorly made. Like, <laughs> I'll, the, our, I have adult kids, they'll come over and I'll show them what I've cooked and they're like, oh, who hurt you? <laughs> why, don't, <laughs> why don't you want to have joy in life? I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, got a lot. So, so, um, you wrote in the book that you kind of like it was a, a risk to like sell your home in the UK and start a vegan bakery. So if I were taking that risk and I were doing any sort of marketing, I don't know that I would have chosen Whistler, British Columbia as like, this is where it's going to work. Like, yeah. I know, you, you know, you've been there for the for the, uh, the snowboarding and the sea school and all that. What was there? Was there like we're just going to try it here because this is where our roots are? Or was it like, I think, like, what was the, the business thinking? That there wasn't any that? business thinking, Howie. It was like Ed was making sourdough. And oh, no, I don't. No, I don't originally there wasn't. You just wanted to make it for some friends. True, as the start. And then the friends told other friends. And then before you knew it, it was more and more people coming hmm. to get bread. And then it was like, oh, God, this is turning into a massive, this is 150 loaves a week now. And it was the community <laughs> actually quite aggressively said, you need to open a bakery. And then, okay. you know, then you start thinking more like a business. And you think, oh, I've got all these people asking and demanding it. There's a, there's a market here. Like, I need to take advantage of this opportunity. Like, a lot of people sit around going, I want to start a business, but I don't know what to do. But I think <laughs> for us, it was the other way around. It was like we were doing something, and then it became a business. It was very, um, it was very natural. It was very organic. We didn't go straight to opening a brick-and-mortar bakery and selling our house previous to that i was i was baking bread at the restaurant for customers and then took it home and made it for friends and our yoga studio and then it started like you know can i rent the kitchen can i make 30 loaves on a wednesday morning and bake it thursday morning and it was just a very small facebook business so actually i only invested about 500 dollars to start and then like mm -hmm. natasha said it sort of snowballed it kind of just grew, got momentum. People were talking about it. Um, and at a certain point, after about a year of doing that, people were saying, you should open a bakery. Like, we have one bakery here in Whistler, um, but they didn't really make sourdough. They they were more sort of sweet-focused. Um, mm. So at that point, they wouldn't have known it was going to be a vegan bakery, but it definitely got us thinking, like, okay, well, we want to live here long-term. It's not the ideal place because staffing is very difficult. It's a very transient town. And we have very, you know, a lot of highs with a lot of tourists coming to town. But then it gets very quiet as well. So mm. in, in that sense, it's not a great place. It's not as consistent as a city would be. Um, but we knew we wanted to live here long term. And we knew if we had our own business. We, we could make it vegan. So it would align with our morals. Um, and we could, we thought we'd be good bosses. We'd had good bosses and bad bosses, and we thought we'd take a bit of the, the good and, and sort of go with it. Mm -hmm. Well, th that's, that sounds like the smartest sort of marketing business development story I've ever heard. <laughs> like, you just, you know, responded to existing demand. And yeah. That's Thanks, fantastic. Al. We, we weren't that smart though because we did things like we called it bread before we discovered if you could get a website called bread.com yeah. which you can't so it became Ed's bread again but we'd already decided <laughs> that the shop was called bread we did loads of stupid things we opened up without <laughs> telling anyone we didn't tell any of the newspapers to come and like cut a ribbon like we just we just opened up we barely even conceived the menu when we opened it was like a few days before like I guess we should do something gluten-free. What are we going to do? Um, we just came up with something and just got the place open uh, and then started to fine-tune our systems. Like, I remember the first few months, I remember staff were really upset because I would tell them one way to do something, Ed would tell them another, and they were like, I don't know, I don't know who to listen to. 
And so it took us a while to figure out, you know, like the way of the way, what is our way? Um, years later, we've got like much better systems and very clear onboarding processes, training programs. Everything's a lot more um, easy, to, easy to adapt to and streamlined. Mm -hmm. and, and the staff are like, they get trained up very quickly and they're very happy. So we think, um, and so it's a lot better now, but that was all, you know, the learning curve. When I look back on how we opened, um, it was very naive. And I don't recommend uh -huh. anyone opens um, a business in a ski resort, to be honest. <laughs> don't be uh -huh. as crazy as we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wonder if, if any of the staff or people who are like going on pilgrimage to learn from you guys, as opposed to the typical like bakery wait staff who are just sort of, you know, up to make some money for the season. Yeah, we do have a lot of people contact us from overseas and things like that. But uh, a lot of the time it's, it's tricky to get visas and, and then, you know, keep someone like it's great to do stages where you go and work sort of a week or two weeks with someone. But for us, we're so small. We kind of, we're always looking for people that are going to stay for six months to a year or longer. Yeah. So, like yeah. I said, there's a lot of transient people and the average worker in Whistler, you know, stays for three months. Our mm -hmm. average is, is a lot longer than that. I think it's six to eight months because we're a B Corp company. So we, we pay a good living wage. We have good benefits, health benefits, um, mm -hmm. you know, and lots of other things that we do to make it a nice place to work. Yeah, because it, se it seems like, you, have a, a, you know, one of the enviable parts of your business is that there's very little competition. Like unless somebody else wants to start a vegan sourdough, yeah. you know, bakery in Whistler. Like if someone starts one, you know, thirty miles away, or Los Angeles, or Peoria, or New York. Like you, you know, you could be training people, not just in like the baking, but like the whole business, like to accelerate their progress and avoid your mistakes. Like you see, it sounds like you have a blueprint. And that is something that we're starting to consider now. Is a relocation to to maybe a city like Vancouver, maybe changing the concept so we can roll it out and have a bigger impact as well. Mm. Um, I always say we're a small business with a big impact. Like we've planted over 70,000 trees in the last couple of years. And like Ed said, we have a great benefits program for our staff. And we, we try to run our business as ethically as we can and be the the employer of choice and be the employers that we never had when we were <laughs> for other people um but it's it's tough because you know we have seasonal workforce here and trying to retain people people aren't even career minded here they come here to have fun they're not coming here to like, learn no, a skill did. yeah i came here mm. to have fun but for me it was like I thought that I would go back to England and go back to teaching. Um, but what I actually did was decide to find a new career and, li and live as a sort of local long-term person in a ski resort. But most of our staff aren't. They, they are just here for a year at best. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. that is quite a challenge. And I think for us to really continue, we probably do have to consider something bigger. And that's really what we've started doing now. The book is launched. It's like people are saying to us, well, what do you want to do with this book? What do you want the book to do for you? And it's kind of like, well, yeah. hmm, what could we do now, you know, with the extra credibility yeah. and more kind of people knowing about us? Maybe we could take the brand a little bit further than just our ski resort town. Yeah. Well, it reminds me, you, you talk about um, Miyoko Shinner in, yeah. in the book. And like, you know, she wrote, I think it was 2014 when she'd written... Um, you know, artisan vegan cheeses. And then everyone was like, and, and, and then, you know, yeah. th two years later, she, you know, had a company with, uh, you know, products all over the world. Yeah. Yes. So, you yeah. Know, I think you, you, you made a book, you know, you, you, you can't back down now. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to me. Yeah. Yeah, mm. for sure. And it would be so uh, different, you know, food and beverage business the industry is you know always under pressure with um a transient workforce i feel and it's also quite a vulnerable industry in that you know if there's a recession or any kind of pandemic or any of these horrible things that can come along um it can be one of the first things people cut back on is eating out and stuff but with a bakery concept it's interesting because 
you are making a staple food, bread, and um, people take a lot of comfort in that as well. They, you know, it's such a staple of the the Western diet, really. So mm-hmm. I feel like we could we could do a lot more with our brand, and we're kind of excited for the future to make some big plans. Mm. Well, and and when the pandemic hit, right, the number one thing that people started doing for, was yeah. making sourdough. <laughs> like yeah, that's partly partly how we got the book deal, to be honest, because yeah. uh, Penguin Canada. Uh, our publishers is that that's kind of how they heard about us we got featured in uh, Forbes um, so we're very lucky to be featured in there and then I think they also heard us on sort of a couple of podcasts um, like your show um, and that saw our Instagram they did a bit of research because yeah they saw this huge interest in sourdough um, and then they reached out and, and said would you be interested in writing a cookbook um, which never comes at the right time. We were working crazy hours, which we still do, but you couldn't, couldn't really say no to Penguin. Um, such a huge yeah. pub, such an honor that, uh, yeah, we decided to, to give it a go. Well, I'm seeing a theme here. You guys are just sort of hanging out and people are like making demands of you and you're like, well, okay. <laughs> yeah, so. That is kind of how our life seems to unfold. Yeah. 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 But it's, you know, that's, it's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. We step into it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot, lot of people be like, oh, I'm sorry, we're working too much. You know, some people might say no. So we we just say yes to any good opportunity, basically, and make it work. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I think that's the key is just throwing yourself into it and saying yes as much as possible. But we're learning now mm-hmm. to have boundaries and sometimes it's OK to say no. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. So, so we're we're half an hour in, and we haven't talked about bread yet, as in B R E A D. Yeah. Um, so the book's about like sourdough, and sourdough is different. I mean, a lot of people know about it, but not many still. So, can you describe like what what what's the difference between the breads that you feature in the book and that you make in your bakery, and what most of us think of as you know, white bread, whole wheat bread, yeast okay. breads. Yeah, so I mean, the interesting thing is, I think the best way to describe it is going back, like previous to sort of our generations and sort of our, our grandparents' generations, let's say in the last 100 to 80 to 100 years, all bread was sourdough. So we've been making bread as humans for over 15,000 years. And it's only in the last 80 to 100 years that we've started using commercial yeast. Um, previous to sort of that, everything was naturally fermented and made with a culture. Um, so in 1920s, 1930s, um, you had these early brands like Wonder Bread and things develop quick, um, fast acting yeast that would speed up the process um, to about six hours or less, where you could add sort of this dried yeast flour, water, salt, um, prove it, shape it, bake it, and eat it. Whereas previously, you know, sourdough, it, it's, it's slow fermented. It's using bacteria from the air, uh, microbes, cultures, um, that basically you add a culture like you would um, kombucha or something like that. So it's just basically it almost looks like pancake batter, it's just flour and water and the active bacteria. And we feed that with fresh flour and water and that keeps it alive. And we put some of that into our dough um, and we don't need to use any of this commercial yeast. And it, and it ferments for a few hours and we, we stretch it and fold it, shape it, put it in the fridge so it slowly ferments overnight, usually for at least 12 to 18 hours. And then we bake it the following day. So at the bakery, we're, we're always working a day ahead. For example, today I'll be making the bread to be baked tomorrow. So it's a long, long, slow process, um, but it's far superior for our health. Um, it's great for our microbiome. It's great for our gut health, fermented foods. We should be in as many as possible. Um, and it just tastes better. It's, it's got a nice sourness to it. You get a really nice crust. Um, and then you can use that culture to make sweetbreads. You can make sourdough donuts, you can make waffles, pancakes. 
a whole array of different different sort of baked goods that you can use that culture for. But then you've got issues of shelf life. So once the loaf is baked, um, it's going to go into a process of, they call it retrogradation. I think uh, basically it's starting to stale from the minute it's baked and cooled down. And obviously supermarkets uh, want to preserve their products for as long as they can. So in comes the the wave of preservatives and additives in their most mm -hmm. simplistic form. You'll find a lot of the best sourdough you can find in a supermarket has sugar added to it because the sugar will keep it soft on the shelf for a few days. Um, whereas in a bakery like ours, we notice a difference between bread baked on the day and bread sold if we were to keep it overnight. It, we would never mm. sell that full price. If we had leftover bread, we would discount it the next day and say to the customer you know this is day old but to be honest we don't have much of that happen in our bakery because we are so popular which we're very grateful for but um we we promote you know when people say things like oh my god i need to buy another loaf i just ate the whole thing i say well you know fresh is best because you're eating the bread in its best for best state you can and we're not adding any preservatives to our breads to extend their shelf life if anything, we would say, you know, if you really want to keep it for a long time, the best thing to do is slice it up and freeze it. Um, but just to, just to give you some numbers, Howie, the, the, the supermarket bread that comes sliced, you know, in a plastic bag, put it in your cupboard for two or three weeks, a, a bread like that would have anywhere from 25 to 35 ingredients. Like Natasha mentioned, sugars, um, milk powders, stabilizers, chemicals, chemicals emulsifiers, numbers that we don't even know what they are. So 25 to 35 ingredients, whereas sourdough, truly fermented sourdough, will have flour, water, and salt because the culture, the sourdough starter, is just flour and water. And then we add more flour and water and a bit of salt. Um, so three ingredients. So it's pretty crazy to think like at its rawest form, sourdough, how we've eaten for thousands of years, is three ingredients and then 1920s, 1930s come in and they add all these extra things to make it faster and therefore more profitable for for the companies. They strip out all the bran, all the, the whole grain, the good part, and you've just got this white paste that they just, just bake up. And usually, depending on the country you live in, this white flour that they're using to make the bread where they've stripped all the bran and the endo, you just left with the, what's called the endosperm, which to most people is just white, 100% white flour. Um, this has to have synthetic vitamins added back into it because all the nutrition has been stripped out. And because it's a staple food, bread, the government generally um, forced the mills to add back synthetic vitamins. So that in itself is kind of an insane thing that you're removing all the vitamins, all the nutrition from the bread, uh, the natural nutrition, and then you're adding back in synthetic nutrition so that the, the population maintains some sort of health. Um, but that, that to me is just bizarre. So we do promote um, using whole grains, if not 100%, maybe a blend, you know, like how we might do a baguette with 70% bread flour, white flour, and then 30% spelt, for example. So we do promote using whole grains. But that said, you know, white flour does give a nice, soft, fluffy texture that people do love. We'll often get customers ask us, do you have a white sourdough? And I have to say, no, we don't do anything completely white. We've got some whole grain loaves. We've got a blend. And um, what we found is most people love our bread and say it has lots of flavor. And that, that really does come from the whole grains. Mm -hmm. But one other thing I'd like to add is that Ed was mentioning that in the sort of industrial revolution, we started to see all these additives come into our foods. We also saw um, sprays put on crops um, like never before. And the big one in our industry is something called glyphosate, commonly known as Roundup. Um, and this is a, a weed killer that is sprayed in massive quantities on monocrops of wheat and other um, foods. Um, but with the wheat, this this glyphosate it gets into the soil into the water systems and it kills life and it's polluting the planet and when you're eating a lot of wheat products 
you're you're potentially eating a lot of this glyphosate as well, which is thought to have led to cancers and a whole array of health issues. So we promote organic grains as well um, as much as possible. So we're all about using whole grains, eating organic as much as you can, and um, not adding stuff to bread that doesn't that shouldn't be there. Keeping it as natural and simple as possible. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like so. You know what industry wanted to do from the beginning of the of the twentieth century was scale efficiently, and for efficient scale, you want this powdered yeast that's produced in one place where it's the same everywhere, as yeah. opposed to like you have no idea. You start do a starter, you have no idea what's going to end up in it. Yeah, right. I remember I remember reading about these twins who worked in the same like. Um, um, like um, basically a sauerkraut factory, like, you know, like a, mm -hmm. what's the, the, the Korean uh, oh, fermented vegetables? Kimchi. The two women working in a kimchi factory and when science and they were twins and they were working next to each other and scientists could figure out whose kimchi was whose yeah. because they had slightly different bacterial compositions. Wow. So like what you're what you're talking about is really kind of undermining the basis of <laughs> Yeah, of a, of a, of a of an industrial economy. Yeah, yeah, totally. It is, it is from from you know, I could be making sourdough in Whistler, and my friend could be making sourdough in Whistler. They can taste different. They can react different. Um, it, it's kind of crazy how the microbes that, that we can't even see how they, you know, it's magic. They like you know they like my hands. They like me sort of like making bread with them, and they're used to that. And if it's changed, someone else does it, then they can change with that. Like even another baker within our bakery, um, I can notice like subtle differences or the weather, for example, is a huge factor, especially for us here in the mountains. You know, the bread between the summer with the humidity and, and the, you know, minus 25 degrees Celsius that we're getting now, you know, there's a lot of changes that have to happen. So like you said, these, these big, companies that want to churn out thousands and thousands of breads they want consistency and they want it the same year round they want to avoid any sort of wastage um, but unfortunately that's the detriment to our to our health hmm. yeah i mean as I, was, as I was reading the book it really made me think like yeah it's it's a book about making bread but you you really are like challenging the notion of what life is about like you're saying like if 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 we're not, if we're not, you know, if I make a loaf, if I make a loaf according to, you know, with my packaged yeast, I can just, I don't have to really pay attention. I can be listening to a podcast, but you're, you're asking us to like reprioritize attention and slowness, mm -hmm. which, which are both, you know, in short supply. Like, yeah. like well, if, if someone, if someone. Sourdough baker. <laughs> Sorry, say, say that again. I missed it. Well, we're asking you to do that if you're going to make it yourself, which is obviously why you might buy the book, but also educating people on why you might choose your local sourdough baker over your grocery store. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so you could stick. Yeah, but, uh, you could stick to the cakes and cookies, and then just come and come and buy bread from us or from your local. Uh, baker. <laughs> yeah, but there was there was something you know. I'm start, I'm reading the first chapter, and it's like very very specific ingredients, and I'm getting a little intimidated, right? Twenty five to twenty eight degrees Celsius, and like ah, uh, and then and then you want me to have a, a digital scale so that I can't just you know like use my butter knife and, and top off the cup measure. And you're re you're really like you're I'm like you guys are asking a lot of me, and part of me is like no I you know this is too hard. But another part is saying like, what would life be like if this was if this was the basis of my existence of paying attention to slow things of quality? Yeah, and I was like, this ain't bad. Like I could I could I could see myself being happy. I, you know I had visions going out into the garden and like snapping the, the pea to see, oh, is it ready yet? Like there's, there is something, there's something romantic and I think nourishing about looking at life this way that I don't get from, you know, fast cuisine. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, totally. I think we all need to slow down a bit. And that's why I think there was such a boom in sourdough during the pandemic because everyone found they Mm. had this extra time on their hands. And eventually you can be scrolling through social media, but we all desire more than that. And we want to be creative and make something that we can share with friends and family. And sourdough kind of falls into that. You know, you notice these little differences when you have the time. But the more you make it, the more you can you know, run your life around it. You know, you can make the dough in the morning, pop out to the shops for an hour, come back, do the next stage. You know, it doesn't have to fully dictate your day. I think it's just like anything, building your confidence once you've done it a few times. Um, And that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to make, write a book that gave people confidence in us as authors and themselves, that if we give them the information, then, then the more they do it, the more they'll enjoy it as well. Um, so ho- hopefully, you know, once you get through more of the recipes, you know, and there's the great thing about the book is it was kind of a cookbook that we wanted to own ourselves. So there's, there's chapters, there's gluten-free chapters, there's cakes and cookies and muffins, and then there's things to enjoy with bread. So there's spreads and dips. Um, there's some vegan cheeses in there. So it's not strictly for the sourdough baker. There's about 50% of it is bread. Um, but there's a lot of sort of plant-based baking in there as well that can be made for special occasions. And there's some pastry in there. You know, there's mince pies and pecan pie and different tarts. Hmm. Yeah. So, so one of the things that struck me as maybe a bit of a paradox is that you're hearkening back to the 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 traditional history of bread making until the you know, last 150 years or so. Um, and yet you kind of encourage or insist on like modern digital equipment to get it right. How, how, do, you, how do you square that? Well, you can go about it your own way, Howie. You can use your cups and you can kind of mull along and when you don't get the result that you desired that you see on Instagram with all the uh, beautiful photographs that all the bakers around the world are putting out and you want to go, well, why? I wonder why my loaf doesn't look like that. Then you can use this book as a resource to maybe troubleshoot what, what those things might mm-hmm. be that you could tweak. But if you look back to the ancient breads of uh, Egypt, where it's thought that um, the first kind of bread, sourdough bread, was created on a rock in the sun. Um, they were very different to what we see as bread today. You know, they were flat breads. Mm. Um, they weren't necessarily like people weren't necessarily going around with a loaf of bread under their arm or a baguette um, back in ancient Egypt. So food has evolved. It has definitely evolved. I think for us, it's more about honouring the essence of things like using organic, um, using whole grains, keeping it natural rather than going into this sort of industrialized world of the last hundred years. Because I see that as a kind of, it was a band-aid. It was a quick fix post-war. There was lots of malnutrition. Mm. We needed to feed people quickly. We needed to get people up to healthy weights. Fabulous, you know, what a great job we did of that. But it shouldn't have lasted this long. It shouldn't have been the way we kept going. And now we're seeing, you know, children in America and other European and Western countries are starting. They're actually starting to think that they might um, die before their parents because of the health problems of obesity and whatnot, diabetes. So when you see something like that happening, this shift of like public health epidemic in rich countries, You've got to ask yourself, where where have we gone wrong? What do we need to go back to the past to remember? Because it wasn't always like this. And I think that's what our book is saying. It's saying these are our modern tastes and preferences. We like fluffy white bread. But actually, this loaf of bread we're buying in the store these days is probably not the best thing for us. So let's remember, what did our grandmothers eat? What, what were people eating generations ago when they didn't have these issues? And how can we bring that into the modern world? So, yes, let's keep using the digital scale because it's exact and it will help us get that result. After all that time and effort, you don't want to go through a whole bread making process and have it not turn out very well. You want to take a snap and put it on TikTok or something, right? You want, 
show it off to the world. Look at my sourdough. So we appreciate that, but also eat something that's going to nourish you and taste delicious as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't, at the same point, I totally agree with what Natasha's saying, but it's not all about just taking a no. picture. To be honest, <laughs> if it looks terrible, it's still going to taste good and be yeah. for you. You know, it's not yeah. all, all about aesthetics and it looking great. Uh, I think the pleasure that I get and that I see other people get from making pre, um is, is is really cool. Like it's a bit frustrating sometimes, but kind of proud. Like I get sent loads of pictures from people, and I'm like, why not look great? But I bet it tastes awesome. Mm. Make the loaf yeah. that you believe in. <laughs> mm. Well, also, also, you know, like you said, we we like a white, cr uh, fluffy bread. So when I was, you know, in, in elementary school. So my mother's originally Austrian. So all the kids were getting peanut butter and, and Welch's grape jelly on Wonder Bread, and the lucky kids would have the crust cut off. I was getting this, this spread called Lip Tower, which was like a cream cheese plus capers, like, like not for, on like, you know, caraway rye. And <laughs> wow. all, like all I wanted was, was Wonder Bread, and I never got it at home. And like it's just, it became it was a surprise to me as an adult that store bought bread tastes gross now compared to yeah. like you know these rich flavors even caraway rye or oh, wow. pumpernickel or full corn bread like these like we're we're like maybe for children <laughs> like it feels like we're 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 feeding the whole country like baby food yeah yeah I totally agree. That was a shock for me when I started working as the raw vegan chef in this salad bar. Parents would come in and they would buy themselves like a salad bowl or a wrap or whatever it was. And then they would say, do you know where we can get kids food? And I was like, what are you talking about? Baby food? I thought they meant like purees <laughs> or jars. And they were like, oh, kids food, you know, kids food. And what I came to realize. Chicken fingers. Junk, yeah. junk food is kids yeah. food, which is crazy because these are the little people that are growing that need all the nutrients to keep growing and be healthy and strong and we're feeding them the junk while a lot of adults are sitting at home with the salad and taking the healthy option and i'm like that's got to change that's that's seriously wrong you know you're going to feed your three-year-old chicken nuggets while you go and get the I salad it, wrap i think it comes from parents to sort of like giving up a little bit giving in you know oh he won't she won't eat that whereas like you said it's like when we were kids, you don't get the choice. It's like you're getting the caraway rye bread. Are you are you paying for it? You know, sometimes I feel like you just got to give it to him from an early age. And you know, I remember my brother being at, at the table and hiding food in his pockets to go and flush down the toilets because he didn't want to eat broccoli or whatever. So my mum ended up having to check his pockets before he left the dinner table. So I think sometimes it's just sort of like parents do know better. Um, they just give in a bit and it's just convenient just to give them um, beige food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I see the same thing with, um, with, with iPads, right? With yeah. tablets these days. Like I'm sure that when I was a new parent, if there had been a, an iPad, mm -hmm. you know, here, let daddy sleep for 10 minutes. You know, yeah. like, there's no question that I would have gotten my kids happily addicted to it. <laughs> yeah. So I think, so I think it also speaks to like what we need is like, like your book is going to help individuals yeah. um, make sourdough improve, but we really need to, you know, like the other thing that I'm, I'm thinking that your, your work can foster is community. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, why, why do we make it so hard yeah. to, to, to live, to thrive as individuals, as a family, mm -hmm. that we need, we need such convenience food. We need everything to be so fast and efficient. Yeah. Um, yeah, like you say, it, it comes from the, the business owners really making that product available and governments as well, you know, giving proper subsidies and helping the farmers, you know, grow more organic food and making it, easier for us as consumers yeah yeah so so you have you have the book out and it's called bread b-r-e-d and it's available everywhere books are sold i, I looked you guys up on amazon you've got 4.9 stars which is yeah. 
Thank you. Better, better than any book I've ever written. So, <laughs> congratulations. Yeah, but thank you so much. I don't. I never. I never put a, uh, a recipe in my book. So, <laughs> <laughs> which is why the which is why the reviews weren't lower. Um, what What else do you have come um, on tap? I know you've been. You're you're doing the podcast circuit to promote. Um, anything else exciting happening? Yeah, I mean, we sell, we've done really well book sales at the bakery. So if anyone's in, you know, BC uh, or Vancouver, uh, Whistler area, you can come into the bakery. We've got lots of signed copies. Um, like you said, it's on all online book platforms. We're um, getting a lot of interest in shipping things like our sourdough starter and that type of thing. Um, so we're starting uh -huh. to look into that now, like shipping a sourdough starter to people because people are saying they feel intimidated to get it going or they haven't had yeah. good results in the past. Mm. So they mm. just would rather have ours. And we figured out that you can dehydrate it and send it in the mail. So um, that's something that we're currently right. looking into as well. Yeah, it just speeds up the process. You know, you can get that dehydrated starter that we've just air dried at the bakery um, for a couple of days. We can ship it out to people and literally just add flour and water and within two or three days you'll be able to start making sourdough so you know if we can do that and help people get started then that's an exciting mm -hmm. little sort of side project we're working on so does that mean if i neglect my dough for a while and it dries out it's not garbage well it depends if it's been active so it the starter that we're dehydrating is extremely active it's you know six years old now so it's been mm -hmm. fed every day, twice a day. We feed the starter every 12 hours. So it's got lots of um, active bacteria um, and, it, and it's almost guaranteed to work. But if you just sort of leave it yourself, you know, it's like a child, like you mentioned earlier, that needs, needs nurturing mm -hmm. and taken care of and uh -huh. feeding regularly. <laughs> yeah, you definitely have to three, feed a, a one-month-old more than a six-year-old. <laughs> Cool. Well, that's exciting. Um, again, the book is Bread, and your your website is Ed's Bread. That's it. Yeah, and then you can also find okay. us. We're pretty active on Instagram. We try and do sort of tutorial style videos, um, so you can find us on Instagram, Ed's uh, so EDS underscore B R E D. And the website is edsbred dot com as well. So we've got loads of. Um, Loads of blog posts on the website that people can read through about everything sort of that we've discussed today. Um, so yeah, or, or you can sort of send us a, a message on Instagram and you know if you've got questions about the book or making sourdough, um, we always try and answer people's questions through that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for for making you know, it's a gorgeous book. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I was I was very distracted right before this call because I was just sort of perusing it again and and like I, I keep oh my god look at this like miso chocolate babka oh that's so good that's mind blown <laughs> so there's there's a lot of there's a lot of fun in there we talked about sort of you know serious um culinary and, and anthropological and philosophical topics but there's also just amazing foods in there so i i hope people will uh will go out and get it and, and try it and i think i think this could be the basis of a you know, a little tilting of, of culture. And um, if they enjoy it, they can even leave us an Amazon review and keep it keeps on that 4.9. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, Amazon reviews are kind of like adding to the starter, right? You need you you, yeah. you need to keep adding to them. So <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Totally. So terrific. Well thank you guys so much for, for being on the show and best of luck. And I look forward to, to seeing the, the continuing and growing impact that you you are having over the years. Great. Thanks for having Thank us, you, Harry. Howie. A pleasure.